Hello, this is Jim Schaefer, executive producer and host of Rip Rap, the academic book television program. My guest today is Randall Beyer. Today we'll be discussing scholarly research. Welcome to Rip Rap. Glad to be here yet again. I thought before we start our formal discussions, we talk a little bit about the passing of Carl Port, who was the owner of Shaman Bun drum bookstore that we still use as the introductory credits mm -hmm. for this program because he was a, a crucial uh, element in getting this program going mm -hmm. 16 years ago. Mm -hmm. Indeed. And uh, one of the obituaries I read called him a gentle soul and I think that comes close to who he really was. There's another link there with your title, Rip Rap, of your program, which is a book of poems by Gary Snyder. And I know Carl Port was a lover of Gary Snyder and also knew him and, you know, had, had been at conferences in his uh, writing days um, and I think uh, was an acquaintance with Gary Snyder. Well, and we actually filmed or videotaped uh, a program with Carl on the last day. Of the Shame and Drum store, which closed maybe 2000, 2011, 2009, Nine. okay. And we'll post that on YouTube so mm -hmm. people can watch it. Right, right. It's quite a significant moment. Definitely. But the thing that bothered me was that he had a very difficult kind of cancer. Mm -hmm. It was a thyroid and then he had tumors, brain tumors, and those are very, very painful. And so, but he was quite a force, you know, in publishing community, both nationally, internationally, and state and local level. And, you know, Shaman Drum was a, one of the most innovative uh, stores in the whole country. And that's uh, what he founded. Um, it started, and a lot of people don't know that, he started with textbook sales. And that was the basic backbone of his business. And when the U of M started shifting how it was doing that so people could order online, it took away his that took away the his major income source. right the bread and butter kind of aspect of things huh? um, he was also very involved with civic things he was you know in terms of uh, the downtown area that state street area building you know helping people get started um, and many many people have remembered him you know uh, over the, the his influence and their lives over the years, and um, he taught three years in the English department of the U of M Flint. He taught a course in Native American literature, which I find interesting, at Michigan. He served eight years on the Downtown Development Authority in Ann Arbor, one year as president, Ann Arbor Art Fair president, and two-term board member of the American Booksellers Association. So he was very involved guy. We deeply appreciated his support over the years. Uh -huh. And he supported our getting this program together even though many people told us it would never happen. <laughs> um, so I'd like to transition to a huge story or situation that's developing and because it's emblematic of how scholarly research can help um, understand what's going on, and that's Detroit filed the biggest municipal bankruptcy case ever just recently within the last week or so. And I found a couple of books um, about this issue because it turns out there's a serious dynamic going on in this country with these big cities. Mm -hmm. Uh, or what Brian, Brent Ryan is the author of this book, Design After Decline, How America Rebuilds Shrinking Cities. Um, and in my discussions, I found out that there's more empty space now in Detroit that, uh, that equals the size of a city of San Francisco mm -hmm. because you have vacant houses, you have uh, the old train station, you have the pa Packard plant, there's all these industrial and private properties that are not being used. But um, 
what do you do with this? You know, um, and like Ryan says, um, the optimism did exist in Detroit and other Rust Belt cities such as Philadelphia and Cleveland. Um, you know, there's some new housing being constructed. Um, this is the book, by the way. And, um, but I found this a pretty, very literate thing of this issue, the fate of what they call the older cities. Um, what are you going to do? You know, how are you going to be, how are you going to rebuild these cities so they're functional? Because I have students who are living on blocks where there's only two occupied houses. Mm -hmm. There's vacant lots where houses have been demolished, and there's other houses that have been burned out. Right. And there's drugs going on there, and rapes, and everything else. Um, and so, what do you do with this? I mean, it's a huge issue. Um, and they're talking about there for a while. There was this urban renewal, so it was kind of like you know process, but that was kind of like a band aid. I mean, these are deeper issues that are going on. And the fact that Detroit now has had to file bankruptcy is is a huge issue. Um, you know, Jane Jacobs had that book about the death and life of American cities, but it's even worse <laughs> than what she thought it would be. Um, because they talk about, you know, they were the master planners of the 60s. Oh, so we're going to fix all uh, this stuff. Uh -huh. The trouble was the cities didn't have the money to do the grand plan. And... Um, um, and then they, they, it, it's, it's a deep problem, it was like Ryan says, about America's shrinking cities and what's going to happen. You know, there's, there's some of the, what they used to call the projects, which were started as an attempt to help low-income fa families. Mm -hmm. Then they turned into just rampant crime right. sites where the police didn't want to go there because it was so dangerous. And now they're demolishing that. So where are these people going to go? You know. Yeah. And they became, it may have been in your other book um, on design and architecture, where um, I came across the comment that these were, oh, maybe we can find it, uh, disasters of modernism, where the promise was that we'll have low-income, uh, very accessible buildings, but the actual design of the buildings were like imprisoning people. And they've now, some of them have, from that era, that 60s time period, what, 40, 50 years old now, many of them in the bigger cities, St. Louis, there's St. Louis, Chicago, Philadelphia, New York, they're being demolished. And the whole theme is that you could still have low income housing, but with a completely different approach to environmental neighborhood uh, concerns so that it wasn't just packing people into a sardine can, it was creating an environment where neighborhoods could actually you know, flourish. Um, and it wouldn't necessarily have to be high income uh, area. But the, problem the whole question is, is put, I mean, even the whole term, sorry to interrupt, the whole nature of that, let's build for low income, let's build for middle income, let's build for high income, that's assuming a whole range of, uh, you know, oppressive political categories that are really working against uh, the betterment of people. Well, it also assumes that there's income. <laughs> and these cities are having yeah, terrible right. problems Income. because yes. the housing crisis right. now means that there's people not living in the houses, not paying taxes on their houses, property mm -hmm. taxes. Mm -hmm. And so the cities aren't getting income right. and they can't pay income tax. If in Detroit they have an yeah. income tax, they can't yeah. pay income tax. So the amount of money is reduced and in filing this bankruptcy um, petition, the deficit in Detroit is $18 billion. Yeah. And it's $2 billion of that alone is for pension. Mm -hmm. And there's a huge uh, uproar. A hue and cry about it because the pensioners, the pension funds are one of the biggest creditors. So that means that you could lose 10%, you could end up with 10% on the dollar, which cuts somebody's pension. Obviously, it cuts what 
Detroit. And of course, people are arguing, well, I in. worked those years, right. yeah. so I should get a pension. Yeah. But it, what's fascinating about this in sort of an odd way is if you, if you haven't got it, you can't pay it. Yeah. You know, and, and it's yeah. just horrible. And from what I understand, you know, with this book and the others, is that this is just the first in municipal bankruptcies yeah. and, and states. You know, the, the, it's, it was unheard of to even think about this. But Detroit tried, and then they called in this emergency manager, and what he did was an audit, and it wasn't pretty. It was really pretty ugly. Yeah, it's not. And so now they're having, they have a process going on also for the school district. They're reducing the number of schools that they're supporting by half because they don't have the enrollment. Very true, yeah. And in fact, the enrollment or the number of people in the city of Detroit has dropped now below 700,000, and it used to be well over a million. See, that's all factors in terms of the economy. Um, but it's really pretty earth-shaking what's going on here. You know, that, that there's dynamics are happening that, you know, you don't know if the city's going to There's yeah. attempts to say, oh, yeah, we're going to survive this, but you have to get through it first. And, and to a certain extent... They're trying to do a quick bankruptcy like General Motors did, and maybe that will work. Mm. But the creditors, including the municipal bondholders, are going nuts because if this sets a precedent that when people buy bonds, they may not get repaid. They might not get repaid. What's it this? could have an impact on all right. the people buying bonds. I wonder what grade the Detroit bonds were in the first place. Junk. Yeah, were they or were Not they rated higher? But they are now. They may have been rated well because the at the time they were issued, maybe. Oh, really? Originally, yeah. Um, but like Ryan points out, this process began 50 years ago. It's not mm -hmm. new. Mm -hmm. He said, "Were America's industrial cities, Detroit, Philadelphia, Cleveland, Baltimore, and others, began shedding people and jobs?" Yeah. Today they're littered with tens of thousands of abandoned houses shattered fa factories and vacant lots. And when they're, this f bankruptcy, that's what the media all seized on. They had all these rusty bikes and, porn, you know, all in the Packard factory. Yeah, they call it ruin porn. <laughs> <laughs> I have heard that one, but. Yeah. Um, yeah, well, there's a lot on, if you look, there are a lot of videos. Of course, the, these, these are, they're like ruins in the sense of looking at ruins from the Roman Empire in Britain, or ruins from abbeys in Ireland, or something like this, or, you know, across Europe. Uh, uh, they are truly ruins with walls crumbled and extremely, you know, like you, if you go into the, some of the, the old uh, uh, theaters, some of the architecture from that era, there actually is this wonderful design, but it's it's crumbling around around it, so it has this uh, perverse kind of attraction. Uh, and artistically, it's exciting to photographers, filmmakers, poets. It has it's it stimulates the arts. You've been in, a in very the old train station. Way. I've been in the old train station when there was a train in it. No, we were Karen and I. <laughs> but were, recently, with the broken windows yeah. and the big arches, no, it's I have scary not. I've only seen they, the photographs and the videos. People stolen the wire, yeah, out of the stripped out all the stripped out the wire, wire and yeah. windows and yeah. copper, yeah, and all that stuff. There's a resurgence of of uh, uh, or a, a production in the past ten years of coffee table books and videos on this phenomenon of Detroit and in fact people are getting kind of tired of it of the you know the 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 artists from France coming to do a artistic art film uh, aesthetic art film on the ruins of Detroit as this kind of monument it's it's just kind of artistically an interesting aspect because monuments have that kind of pull of attraction, old monuments. You know. Well, the, the train station in particular, is, and the Packard plant, yeah. are these bizarre, huge, yeah. just overwhelmingly, you know, I but, read a story that at one point a guy was trespassing and fell into 
elevator shafts that went to fill the water, oh. and he got frozen. Oh, my God. He That's died terrible. from the fall, but he also got frozen, frozen. that way, and they right. didn't find him until someone else went through, oh, and they had to get yeah. him out of the ice. So, I right. mean... Well, the other, another building is the Book Depository Building, which uh, a history colleague of mine did a kind of poetic reflection on. Uh, she writes on American history, and so it was about sort of the, this deterioration of capitalism, education, what this means, and she's got photograph of, after photograph of the book depository with all these books. I mean, they're all warped and molded and, you know, waterlogged. Oh, yeah, from all. the school district. Yeah, just, just strewn, just sitting there. So... Um, there was a guy uh, who specialized in going in all these buildings to, you know, yeah. this document it. So this is the, the underbelly or the, you know, you can make art out of sort of the remains of the past, but this is exactly what your two authors are looking at in a broader, a broader way. I mean, the, the, the amount of free uh, available, not free, but of empty space and open land in Detroit now is, is remarkable. I mean, there are some attempts um, neighborhood attempts to do urban farming, to pull together neighborhoods around these empty uh, kind of spaces. But it's, it's, it's tough because clearly um, the creditors or you can't just go and buy a dilapidated building for a dollar or, you know, two acres of land for a dollar, even though that might make sense that a neighborhood group could say buy a deed. But the people who that they'll then inherit the responsibility to pay some tax on it. So there's got to be some kind of way to build development and somehow deal with the tax situation. Because as you point out, the, those, somebody owns that property and they owe to the city something from it. And uh, a new owner would then inherit that kind of responsibility. That's, that's a well, problem. Well, I guess the thing about Detroit is the magnitude. It isn't just some rural town that has a bridge that doesn't work. Mm -hmm. You're talking a place where they had to tear, just had to tear down a skyscraper because it was so, such bad shape that chunks of bricks were, were falling. falling down and, and glass yeah. and damaging cars and hurting people. Mm -hmm. And so they actually put a fence around it until they could demolish it. But you don't just bring in a, a wrecking ball for a you know a skyscraper. It's got to be done in a very careful way mm -hmm. because there's so, so much debris from it. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, there's that thing. There's also Dan Gilbert from Quicken Loans Company who's buying up skyscrapers. So, I mean, there's both healthy things going on and some really distressing, just out of out of the world right. kind of magnitude yeah. to the, what's going on. And... Um, that it's just mind-boggling. I, I don't know any other word to talk about it. Um, the other book was Driving Detroit. Um, and, and this is really quite nice. It, it's Driving Detroit, the quest for respect in the Motor City. Oh, okay. And he's talking about the same thing. But this is George Galster is the author, and his preface or dedications to my parents, grandparents, great-grandparents, and great-great-grandparents. Detroiters all. He's fifth generation taking a look at this. And, you know, that's really quite interesting to have someone trying to deal with the legacy that the city represents. Yeah, yeah. So I made a quote a moment ago, and I mentioned it was in the other book, but actually it was from Ryan's book, yeah. the bit about the modernism and the buildings, the, the, the actual architectural design. I believe this author uh, has come back to Detroit or He's lived. always lived there. Oh, he has. Okay. Because one of the, oh, it must be Ryan then who has resettled to Texas, but has yeah. come back to write about Detroit yeah. and architecture no, and design. No, Gulfster's still there. Yeah. But what's yeah. interesting about Galster is, and I like this quite a bit as a writer, is he talks about port portraits are inherently subjective. Mm -hmm. 
And so the best portraits are the ones that don't mimic the surface of the subjects, but reveal their subjects' characters. And they do this by a depth of character according to the pigment. In other words, layers, a rich texture of overlaid personal pigments through songs, poems, oral histories, mm -hmm. um, which he does. You know, he bring, and that's what I was telling you earlier about Motown. Motown is a part of Detroit. It came out of Detroit. It represented that audacity of setting a legend in terms of music history. Mm -hmm. um, at the same time, it was kind of romantic impulse that Detroit also has to deal with. You can have the romanticism, but you have to deal with the pragmatics. You have to deal with where, how many taxes you've got, how you're going to care for the people and the property and the stuff that... But also there's different songs in Motown about respect, you know, like Aretha Franklin's R-E-S-P-E-C-T. And so that plays into this too. Respect means that you do care and are willing right. to do what you have to do. Um, and in this book he talks about the economic engine of anxiety. You know, I'd say it's more just absolutely terror. But he talks about <laughs> the elements of greater Detroit make for a place that fundamentally disrespects the citizenry. Mm, mm. You know, where you have all this stuff going on, but people need to be more responsible, more, more respectful of what's happening. I mean, they, they had the mayor that got arrested and indicted. and Several mayors have yeah. sort of bled the city coffers. Well, and it's just a huge corruption thing that goes yeah. all the way through, and they were paying hundreds of, mil of thousands and millions of dollars, you know, just to, you know, for their own pockets. Right, right. It comes from somebody. It comes from the people. Now, what's the general thrust of this driving Detroit? Is he talking about the automobile industry? He's is talking about the, the city, the, driving? the dynamics of the city, and, and driving mm -hmm. is the main thing. It's... Mm -hmm. But he's talking about, in a sense, the, the motivation yeah. to do stuff and get right. it done. Right, what drives Detroit. The first chapter is riding on the freeway a riff on the place called Moto. And he says it's the mother load of symbolism. Hmm. But what does that mean? I mean, well, we talk about made in we've China. We've got the ru ruin poor. I can see that as the mother load of symbolism because we've got these architectural ruins in Detroit that have a kind of romantic... Well, he talks about um, Detroit in terms of, like, people talk about made in China. There was also an yeah. era when it was made in Detroit. But it wasn't considered cheap, right? It had, had a cheap, certain it had to do with being body made by Fisher yeah. and things like that, right? It says, to understand Detroit, you must understand one thing. In its soul, it is a place that makes things, mm -hmm. metal things. Ever since it grew to be a metropolis in the late 19th century, its dominant businesses were about shaping metal into useful objects. Railroad cars, stoves, marine engines, work Airplanes boats, during World War II. Tanks. Yeah. If you count Willow Run, not exactly in Detroit, but certainly the... And there, I mean, there are steel about plants, closing the Rouge a, a, River a, Steel a runway down at Willow Run because it's used so little. Oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. It's fast. So here's another. But the uh there are others in the uh let's save the American City book industry, if I can put it that way, that you hear in, interviewed you know in programs like yours and also uh, on the radio. Um who are saying that there are ways to revitalize the inner cities, the inner core of cities. I shouldn't say inner city, that has a different ring. Uh the kind of downtown core of cities, Philadelphia, Cleveland, um, and Detroit, that are saying, I'm reflecting on one person who's been in the news uh, named Bruce Katz from the Brook Brookings Institution. But one argument is that they're speaking, in a sense, for the elite, not necessarily uh, uh, what do you call the general public, you know? The working class. Uh, right. Hoi polloi. So one critique, for instance, of the Woodward, I was talking with you about this, the Woodward Avenue corridor in Detroit, which goes from downtown, 
past the past the stadiums to the Detroit Art Museum, and then uh, you know B Wayne State University. So that's a definite core pathway. They want to build a light rail or a, a tramway there. That speaks to the elites. They're not talking about the cross city bus system, which is in turmoil. And everyday people need that to get to work. So you're not really talking about that kind of flow. You're talking about a more critical kind of core business, large culture type of aspect. And I, I wonder about that. That, that. that seems like a legitimate critique to me to critique the, uh, the elite point of view. And on the other hand, the core city could be used to attract not manufacturing, but uh, industries that, that rely on you know, the knowledge industry, that they're computer or technology based, that would maybe use the office buildings, but use the infrastructure to move product and whatever. I mean, it's, it's, it's far as far as as far as access, Detroit has extremely good access in terms of roads and in terms of the airport and that sort of thing. Well, what's fascinating to me with Detroit in all these different ways is I think it is an emblematic situation. For example, that's when we got from the UAW the 30 and out notion mm -hmm. that somehow people be able to work 30 years in the mm -hmm. factory and they would be taken care of and for have the rest a of their good lives. retirement, right? Right. No society in history has been able to sustain mm -hmm. that. And they pulled that off for a while. Yeah. Right. But then there comes this point when it would work if the pension plans had been funded. Yeah. But they were not. Right. Well, right. we actually anyway, completed well, another rip rap. Yes, so. and uh, we were rapping and ripping at the same time. Uh, we'll do more in the future. Okay. Right. And this was great. I'm glad. This is a good book to finish on.